on a journey to space. So as we say at NASA, sit down, strap in, shut up, <laughs> enjoy the ride. Just after eight minutes of engine start, you're in space. Going 17,000 miles an hour, you're hundreds of miles above the planet. You have an amazing vista to see the beauty of our planet, its challenges, and its limitations. The International Space Station is arguably the most challenging and ambitious endeavor that humankind has ever created. Sixteen nations came together with their best and their brightest to innovate to solve almost insurmountable challenges. This has contributed not only to human performance in space for now going over 15 years, but also amazing innovations that have come back to our planet to help us. I've been privileged for the last two decades to work with NASA on the Smart Medical Systems team and on the Human Research Project, where we're trying to develop autonomous devices, not only to improve care for these men and women above our planet, but also to bring them down. And I'll use some of the things that we've learned over these last years to try and talk about some of the challenges that we have today, providing care not only here in our city, but across our globe. Now, it might not be immediately apparent to you that providing care on the International Space Station and in underserved areas in our world are very, very similar. When Katie came back two days ago to the Bifenar, my current crew medical officer on the International Space Station is now a Russian engineer. We had 80 hours with him to train him on medical procedures, and let me be frank, you're much more interested in toilet maintenance because you know the consequences of the toilet going bad, which it will, and that then the potential to develop, to develop appendicitis. So we have a real limitation in the medical training on the people providing the care. We have a limitation in resources. It costs $10,000 a kilogram to launch something into in an orbit. So the International Space Station, while amazingly complex, has medical equipment uh, approximately of an ambulance that we would see in our city today. Circling our globe every 90 minutes, communication is a challenge. So very often, we are not in direct communication. I take you over to the other panel that you see above me, and those exact same constraints are seen across our world and here at home. In terms of access to high quality medical care. But with these big, wicked problems comes the amazing potential of innovation. I'll talk about that. Now, as you're starting to think about the next phase of exploration class spaceflight, the long, the long uh, past low Earth orbit, I've got some big problems ahead of me in that. Let's start planning on a trip to Mars. So it's going to be a three year journey. There are no Walmarts on the way, so we have to think ahead for over 500 medical contingencies that may in fact occur. The medical supplies on this will be woefully inadequate for many of those. We don't have diagnostics. Right now we don't have an x-ray machine, we have no CT scanner in that, so we don't know how to diagnose, let alone treat many of the conditions that may occur. Let's think a little bit about communication. I'm a surgeon. So if I tell the crew three quarters of the way to Mars, hey, don't cut there, they don't hear that for almost 15 minutes. So telemedicine, as we practice it today on our planet, really doesn't work in the space and time that I'm starting to talk about. How do we provide medical care when health is 140 million miles away? That is the challenge that we're faced with today. Now, we do have an ultrasound machine. Many of you are familiar with ultrasound. We use it to tell you the sex of your baby, whether you have gallstones, perhaps some things about vascular, but we really didn't know whether it worked in outer space or not. So my team has now performed over 500 hours of ultrasound on the International Space Station before that shuttle. And we learned a lot of things. If you were to learn ultrasound here on the planet, 
takes about 500 hours of training, and I already told you we are woefully inadequate in training time on these very bright individuals. So we came up with ways to just in time to really quickly teach non-medical people really complicated medical stuff. But we really didn't care about pregnancies, hopefully, in outer space. We have that proves that uh, well, I might not want to go there tonight. But we do worry about these other conditions. And so we had a tool, and we started to use it in different ways. And that, so now we utilize ultrasound on a weekly basis on the International Space Station to answer some critical questions. Many of those questions have now translated back to the planet. If you go into an emergency room in our country today with a lung problem, no doubt an ultrasound will be utilized because of our work to diagnose what you have going on. You may have heard had some problems with eyesight on our long duration cruise. So now we look at eyes as an index and a window into the brain. And, that, and this is now translated back to our planet to looking at brain function utilizing an ultrasound machine. It's never been done before because we didn't have to on the planet. We have CTs and MRs and things like that. Really importantly, those, these devices are portable, so they can go battery powered anywhere. And so we're starting to look at this globally. So now we started to talk to people about that. The United Nations, the World Health Organization, working with the Millennial Development Project to try and improve things like infectious disease, maternal care, how can we tell whether that individual can deliver that child in, the, in her village versus having to get on a donkey and go four days to a higher level of care? So we've now been in over 60 countries trying to answer things like that. We also look at musculoskeletal problems. When you're in a zero gravity environment, you lose bone and muscle mass. We had to measure that. And, alter exercise accordingly. So now we can utilize ultrasound to diagnose broken bones, and muscular problems, and things like that. So we now have this amazing tool that individuals who weren't doctors could, could utilize. Manufacturers of ultrasound uh, uh, programs now in the country utilize these techniques that we develop. But I'm from Detroit, and we had this great technology, and I was trying to figure how in the hell can I get wings tickets out of this technology? <laughs> so I approached Detroit Red Wings. I said, hey, we've got this pretty neat technology. It can tell you right on the spot whether or not you have something uh, bad uh, in your athletes. And so now they've incorporated that. So if somebody gets hurt at the Joe, undoubtedly they will utilize this technology to tell them you're good to go. You can get back in the game or you might want to sit out this, this next period. Now, apparently, athletic trainers talk. And so we were approached by the United States Olympic Committee. And they said, you know, we have a problem in uh, Torino. The spirit areas of high mountain uh, roads and that, not accessible to high elevation to fly in helicopters and that. So could we utilize this technology on various venues in, in the Olympics to try and when athletes uh, undoubtedly get hurt? to have a quick assessment uh, of them. So we performed over 200 examinations uh, in these venues. Now I thought the money is going to be in uh, the inverted aerials and in hockey and things like that. So I signed up for those venues. You know where people got hurt the most? Figure skating, for God's sake. <laughs> and, then, and I guess it made sense with all of the spinning and things that they go on like that. So it was utilized there quite a bit like that. So it was subsequently been in every Olympic game since, providing point of care information to try and allow the athletes to ascertain whether they uh, can compete or not. So we were in Vancouver uh, a couple of years ago, and Lindsey Vaughn was uh, supposed to win the women's downhill. You might have remembered that uh, two days before her event, uh, she was on a practice run. She caught an edge at about 80 miles an hour, and she got a vicious uh, spill. Uh, she was uh, evaluated by the team, one of the team physicians uh, of the Olympics, and I said, you know, we, sorry, Lindsay, we think you're out. And, and uh, Lindsay was a real tough competitor, so she said, you know, heard about this new uh, thing that we're utilizing, could you, could you have a look at me? And so, we evaluated her using this technology. She had some injuries. 
And Abby said, you know, we don't think it's going to be career, it's going to hurt like hell, but uh, we think it's not going to be career limiting uh, for you. And so Lindsay skied uh, two days later, she won a gold medal. So I consider one sixteenth of this gold medal mine. <laughs> That's the closest I will ever get to, uh, to earning an Olympic gold medal. Now, I hope that I've suggested to you that we've been able to solve some pretty tough health problems in a wide variety of areas. We have done ultrasound examinations on Mount Everest for high altitude problems that you get in that extreme environment. We've certainly been in a lot of sporting venues. We do a lot of examinations across the world trying to define some of these health problems that heretofore have been unsolvable in that we don't have doctors in most areas. 95% of our globe is underserved as it relates to quality medical care, not just at the doctor level, but certainly below. And often you're going three to 500 miles for any type of radiology, x-ray intervention, or things like that. We started to look at this and train other individuals to provide this high quality medical care. And this shows somebody performing an well baby examination in an Inuit, this is about 50 miles uh, just south of the North Pole. Prior, they had to fly almost a thousand miles to get this uh, type of care in Canada at great expense and, and great hardship uh, to these, uh, maternal, uh, these maternally challenged individuals. So I think we've moved the ball a little bit on potentials for healthcare across our country. But I don't wanna leave you with just saying that this only solves the problems far-flung areas, up in space, or at the North Pole, or Mount Everest, or in, in uh, sporting venues, and things like that. Today, in our cities across our country, and that we have the same disparities in healthcare and that. So we have to think differently. I can't throw doctors in millions of dollars of equipment to solve these health problems that plague us today. We have to be thinking differently. So we started to utilize hospitals as factories of innovation. Now, everybody has to, in every one of the jobs that you have, you have to be somewhat MacGyver-like and innovative. You have to think outside of the box a little bit, but we didn't have facile ways of doing that in hospitals. We were all about healthcare. We really couldn't think about, boy, is this, is this a real good kernel of an idea? So we developed, a, now five years ago, an innovation institute at Henry Ford. And this is where we try to solve those big, wicked problems that we have to tackle every day. We have to do things faster, cheaper, more safely, and that more effectively and more scalable without throwing resources at it. But we also know that we don't have all the ideas. So we've come up with unusual partnerships. One of those is local here. We work with a College of Creative Studies. Now, this is a design center organization. What could they possibly contribute to a hospital? When we embedded their students uh, at Henry Ford, the first thing they noticed was they're looking at our hospital gowns. And they're going, boy, you got to be kidding me. You've been in this 100 years, and you came up with something that your bum hangs out of? And now there's no <laughs> dignity there at all. So they started to innovate on this simplest of problems that anybody who's been a patient can relate to. And now we have a gown with dignity and that that is not commercially viable. We're also utilizing global talent in this. So we've reached out to other countries. India, for example, where frugal innovation, they have to do things for large masses of individuals very cheaply. The state of Israel, which is second to Silicon Valley in that. We now have them innovate with us solutions to those daunting healthcare problems that continue to plague us today. Now, when President Kennedy said almost uh, 50 years ago that we're going to go to the moon in under a decade, there was unprecedented uh, enthusiasm and ambition that resulted not only in a successful uh, landing of Apollo 11, but innovation that brought things to us such as miniaturized uh, medical devices, telemedicine scratch resistant glasses, water filtration, insulin pumps, things like that at every tank, for God's sakes, <laughs> and things that help us uh, every day. I think the credo of NASA 
better, faster, cheaper. It's never truer uh, in medicine than it, than it is today. We have to think differently. Now, I won't be one of those men and women that ultimately sets foot on the surface of Mars, but I, it's my hope that I'll help to contribute to their medical care en route and while they're on Mars, and I hope that that care translates to help all of us here today. Thank you very much.